Good morning. Hello. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2015 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with members of the Resilient Africa Network, or RAN. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'll be moderating the webinar. When I'm not moderating webinars, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or ASME, in the Engineering for Global Development Department as a Senior Program Manager. And we're thrilled to have all of you here today. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, Harnessing Technology to Strengthen Communities' Resilience to Adverse Climate Effects. Just a few days ago, federal scientists in the U.S. declared 2014 the warmest year on record. And just last night, President Obama emphasized the need for action on climate change in the State of the Union address. Climate change is a global issue, and engineers are at the forefront of developing new technologies and strategies to address its effects. The Resilient Africa Network is a key actor in identifying and scaling innovative solutions in their work to strengthen communities' resilience to adverse climate effects in sub-Saharan Africa. RAN Southern Africa Resilience Innovation Lab at the University of Pretoria recently launched the Resilience Innovation Challenge for Food Security and Improved Income Generation, focusing on strengthening resilience by promoting life and entrepreneurship skills, diversifying to profitable enterprises, and improving farming skills. Today, we've invited RAN's leaders to share their insights. We'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Wanchiku Ngana, Director of Innovations of RAN, Dr. Christy Rendell Mkosi, Senior Faculty at the University of Pretoria. And uh, substituting in for Dr. Roy, we have Deborah Nkwanga, who is the Engagement Manager for RAN. Thank you so much for all of you for joining us. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinars uh, series generally. Along with myself, we have Holly Schneider-Brown and Victoria Chung of IEEE, as well as my colleague Mike Mater of ASME. Thank you, team. If you would like to ask any questions or reach out to us with a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact any of the team members via the address email, um, email address that's visible on the slide webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we move on to our presenters, we thought it would be a great idea to remind you about E4C and who we are. We are a global community of nearly 800,000 people, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve humanitarian challenges faced by underserved communities worldwide, such as access to potable water, off-grid energy, effective healthcare, agriculture, sanitation, and other issues. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies such as ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, as well as academic supporters such as MIT's D-Lab, international development agencies such as USAID, EWBSA, and Practical Action as well as access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of the E4C webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring new ideas and technology to bear on global development challenges. Information on upcoming installments of this series, as well as archived videos of past presentations can be found on our page, engineeringforchange-webinars.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, that is hashtag E4C webinars. And we hope you have lots of things to say on that feed. Our next webinar will be on February 18th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Susan Davis, the Executive Director of Improve International. And we'll be looking at the topic of future-proofing water systems in developing countries, how to protect investments, and increase success through preventative maintenance, a really important issue. Visit the E4C webinar page for registration details. And if you're already an E4C member, 
look out for an invitation to the webinar directly. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. On the screen you're now seeing, there are a number of different widgets that relate to the dashboard on the bottom. The group chat is where you will interact with your fellow attendees and post any comments about the webinar. The Q&A widget allows you to submit any questions directly for the presenters. The help widget is for inquiries about any technical difficulties with resources on how to use the software and FAQs. You share this to share the link of this webcast with your friends and colleagues through a variety of social media sites. The Twitter icon allows you to post directly to Twitter. And lastly, the survey icon allows you to take our survey at any time. Now I know this is quite a bit, but always feel free to hover over the icon and you'll receive an explanation. To get you warmed up and to get a sense of who we have here, we know that we generally get folks from all over the world. So let's see where you're from. Using the group chat, please type your location. So we know how we have folks from all around, and we thank you for joining us today. I see we have folks from Virginia, from Udaipur, from Washington, D.C., from Cambridge, Massachusetts, from Chicago, from Austria, from Cleveland, and from Littleton, Canada. Oh, Colorado, I apologize. I missed fire on that one. Toronto, Madrid, wow. We're very excited to have all of you here today. Thank you so much for um, joining us, taking the time this early in the morning, if it's morning for you. During the webinar, continue to use the group chat to type in any remarks you have, but don't forget to use the Q&A window to type your questions to the presenters directly. If you encounter any troubles viewing or hearing the webinar, you may want to try opening up webcast delete in a different browser. Also, feel free to access the help widget for technical help. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour or PDH for the session, please follow the instructions on the top of our webpage, engineeringforchange-webinars.org. Wow, Zimbabwe, India, Italy. I'm, I, I'm amazed, so I'm just keep reading these out. <laughs> so today we will be missing Dr. Uh, Roy William Mayenga, but in his place we are very excited to welcome Debra Nkwanga for, uh, to present his uh, section. So we are going to move on to uh, introducing you to our next webinar presenter. Dr. Wanjiko Nganga is the Director of Innovation at RAN, McHenry University in Uganda where she provides leadership and technical guidance on the sourcing and development of resilience strengthening innovations. She is also actively involved in developing a vibrant network of resilience innovators across RAN's network of universities and communities. Jo joining Dr. Wanjiko will be Dr. Christy Renzo Mkosi. <clears throat> Dr. Christy has a PhD in public health and is a senior lecturer <clears throat> in the School of Health Systems and Public Health at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Most of her experiences in primary health care and community-based rehabilitation in Gauteng and Western Cape. Her recent research focuses on the prevention of fetal alcohol syndrome, interactive care in PMTCT, health promoting school, and community health promotion program development and evaluation. She has specific interest in the prevention of community-level problems relating to alcohol abuse, and has been involved nationally and internationally with training, advocacy, and materials development in this regard. During 2014, she served as a faculty member supporting the SARI lab in stakeholder engagement and preparation for the call of innovations, which you'll be hearing about today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our RAN presenters to share with us their insights. Thank you very much, Yanna, and uh, thank you very much for inviting us and hosting RAN today. We feel very privileged and uh, delighted to speak to all the participants through this webinar. We feel this is a very great opportunity to speak to such a huge network of engineers using this webinar. So briefly about Resilient Africa Network, RAN is one of the eight development labs under the Higher Education Solutions Network in the U.S. Global Development Lab. The Resilient Africa Network is a partnership among sub-Saharan African and American universities led by Makere University in Uganda. RAN is co-directed by Stanford University and Tulane University, and we have partners from Center for Strategic and International Studies, all are working to develop the resilience of communities. RAN has four regional resilience innovation labs, which we call RA, RA labs, and one of them is located in Ghana, another in Ethiopia, in Uganda, 
and South Africa at the University of Pretoria. RAN is supported and funded by the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, and its goal is to strengthen the resilience of people and systems in Africa by leveraging the knowledge and scholarship and creativity that exists across the RAN to analyze vulnerabilities, define resilience dimensions, and apply innovative solutions. Uh, the rationale for RAN is that although development efforts have saved lives, they have not sufficiently built the resilience of target communities. The same shocks and stresses will occur with similar consequences. RAN seeks to break these negative cycles by tapping into the adaptive capacity of communities to develop solutions. RAN is working with three main objectives. The first objective is to design a resilience framework for the sub-Saharan Africa. And the second objective is to strengthen the resilience of communities through innovation. And the, the last objective is about knowledge sharing, that is to enhance the resilience-related knowledge through sharing on our platforms, like e-learning platforms. One is working with a theory, this theory of change, that the resilience of people and systems in Africa will be strengthened and leveraged uh, through their scholarship and creativity within RAN to incubate, to test and scale innovations that target capabilities and reduce vulnerability identified by evidence-based resilience frameworks for sub-Saharan Africa. We are using uh, the scholarly methodologies uh, we have two approaches for sourcing innovation. One of them is to accelerate existing promising ideas, bring them into our lab, incubate them, and pilot within our target communities. The other option is to identify totally new ideas, and uh, through calls like the one we are going to talk about today, and then incubate the same and pilot within our communities. We are using all this using the design thinking or the human-centered design methodology. And right now, I will request Dr. Wan I will welcome Dr. Wanjiku to take us through the technology imperative and tell us more about the methodologies that we are using at Resilient Africa Network. Um, thank you, Deborah, for a good introduction about Resilient Africa Network. So in my presentation, I want to focus on exactly what we mean by building resilience. So the first question is resilience of whom and to what? So over the past two years, RAN has spent a considerable amount of time trying to understand the issues that cause lack of resilience in sub-Saharan Africa and identified uh, six key thematic areas of focus. So we're looking at uh, climate variability and its effects on livelihoods. We're looking at recurrent drought in the Horn of Africa. We're looking at food insecurity and low-income generation in Southern Africa. We are looking at rapid urbanization in West Africa. We are also looking at the issue of internally displaced persons across the Horn of Africa, as well as chronic conflict. And what our uh, audience should appreciate is that most of all these issues are interrelated with uh, climate change and climate variability in one way or another. So in terms of building resilience, we have uh, prioritized the issue of uh, looking at adverse climate effects and asking how can we strengthen our communities to become more resilient to the effects of climate change, but also more importantly to mitigate these effects and also to strengthen the adaptive capacities that communities have been using over time. So how does climate uh, variability manifest today? We're looking at uh, effects such as uh, very heavy rainfall that is maybe not what we have been used to over the many uh, past years resulting in floods and landslides, and this is very common in uh, East Africa as well as uh, Central and Southern Africa. Like right now, we know that there's a lot of um, rainfall and a lot of rain and fears of flooding happening in, uh, in the Southern part of Africa. Then we're also looking at uh, things to do with drought, where rainfall are not in the patterns that have been experienced or expected uh, to fall uh, as planned. So this results in drought and uh, associated effects. So how, how, does this, how are these 
uh, climate variability effects affecting our communities. The first thing is to note that most of our communities are subsistence farmers, and uh, if most of them are relying on agriculture, then where we have uh, climate variability affecting productivity, affecting harvest, affecting, uh, affecting uh, what communities have to eat, then there's a whole cycle of uh, lack of resilience and poverty and disease and all those things that come without having a livelihood. So this is very a very important challenge that Resilience Africa Network is seeking to tackle. We know it is a big challenge, but we believe that using uh, innovative techniques to first really understand the problem and design solutions that are really context specific, we're going to have an impact on this. Um, so the other so one may ask, we're talking about climate variability, but how does this play out at the household or at the community level? So the first thing we know that our farmers lack practices or technologies that help them mitigate the effects of climate change. They still may be using practices that were used when there was um, less variability in, uh, in the weather. So in terms of the kind of seeds that are there or the kind of farming techniques that are in use, how rapidly are they able to adapt their practices to suit the current challenge that is imposed by, uh, by climate variability. Then the, re the resulting is uh, the result is that there is low agricultural out output, and where in fact there is output, there are so many other factors that con connive to ensure that the produce gets wasted. So for instance, you may harvest after a, a very good season, but then if the rains come in an unplanned way and you don't have a proper storage facility, then you either end up losing most of your harvest or the harvest gets maybe too much moisture if it's maize and uh, a lot of that also gets lost. So it's not just uh, in terms of production, but even post-harvesting, there's so many ways that farmers need support. And this is why we're looking at uh, technologies that can help our farmers in this. Then there's also the issue of flooding and lack of, as I have said, there's loss of crops and assets, as well as uh, waterborne diseases that come along with flooding and uh, lands like their communities are forced to move out of productive areas. Very important also is the issue of lack of potable water, both for human consumption as well as for the animals. And this happens not just where you have flooding, but also where we have recurrent drought and farming, where there's hardly any water and communities have to rely on very dirty water sources. So how can this uh, be addressed? And uh, very Related to that, where you don't have clean water, there are disease epidemics that also affect not just humans, but also livestock. And there's a big uh, relationship between human health and livestock health. And then there's also the issue of uh, housing for communities that are affected by these uh, climate-induced disasters like floods and uh, co chronic conflicts, as well as internally displaced persons as in the Horn of Africa, where we have like the Southern Sudanese refugees or the refugees from Somalia, etc. So what, uh, what is the role of technology? We are speaking to a team or members uh, with an engineering background. Our hypothesis is that we can use technology to help mitigate the effects of climate change either by changing the behavior or the practice or the knowledge of the communities that are largely farmers. So here they're looking in terms of production, can we have better methods to do rainwater harvesting that are amenable to the context in which the farmers uh, live? How can we have low cost irrigation solutions? Then in terms of uh, post harvest processing, how do we, what kind of storage facilities can we construct that are amenable to the local community? How do we uh, speed up maybe produce drying, because a lot of the produce gets lost. In fact, they say 60% of what is harvested gets lost before it gets to market because of the post-harvest processing techniques, either lack of appropriate technologies or lack of knowledge or poor practice uh, skills, uh, practices. The issue of water harvesting and safe storage, early warning systems, especially for things like flooding or landslides, and there's a bit of work being done in that area, but so far we haven't seen really robust uh, interventions that can be applied across very remote uh, settings in Africa. And then uh, resilient housing, uh, sanitation, water and sanitation solutions that are, uh, would be working for flat home areas and high water table areas. But also very importantly is diagnostic 
for diseases that come as, as a result of either water-related diseases or changes in climate. A good example is, for instance, malaria. This, of course, we know it varies, of course, the weather when there's too much rainfall and it's too hot, then we have more and more cases of malaria. And many of the deaths come because of lack of diagnosis. And we're seeing the same thing also with the Ebola challenge in West Africa, that by the time we identify that somebody is actually infected, we don't have to wait for the 21 days incubation period to say that this person is infected. So there's a big challenge for rapid diagnostic uh, to build resilience of communities. Um, so the other thing I want to highlight is the usage context, because you may be asking, the issues we're raising are not new. We've talked about water harvesting, we've talked about irrigation, and there are all those technologies of drip irrigation, there are those types of irrigation where you put over plastic, a polythene paper. But the big challenge we're seeing is that when you're designing for low cost, we talk about low cost technologies where you should not even talk about power, electricity off the grid, so we're talking about maybe solar powered technology. We're talking about uh, remote rural areas with limited or no electricity, with very few uh, road networks or communication networks. So even in terms of scaling or piloting a technology, what is the, the, the value chain that ensures that this technology continues to get used? Because what happens is that you get a technology introduced, maybe a solar lamp, it works very well, but when it breaks down, there is no value chain around the fixing or the maintenance that the farmers are able to accept. So we're not just asking for the hardcore technologies, but it's also the business model around it to make this accessible and affordable and sustainable in very poor settings. Um, so we can we'll be open for questions after this, but I just thought it's good to highlight the kind of uh, Technologies we see are very important in terms of uh, strengthening the community's resilience to adverse climate effects. And at this point, I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Kirsty, to talk about the exact context for the Southern Africa region. Thank you. So I was just thanking Dr. Wendiko for the introduction. And I want to, in general, um, thank the, the uh, RAN for the opportunity to be able to uh, promote our particular call for innovation. So it's a rather a long name, our Resilience Innovation Challenge for Food Security and Improved Income Generation. So that's why we shortened it to hopefully what is fairly catchy, which is RIC for Feed. Um, our lab is based at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And I just want to mention that we have university partners at the University of Limpopo, which is also in South Africa and then at the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Nat um, Natural Resources in Malawi. Um, and we have focal persons at, at each of those um, universities, as well as a focal person based in Zimbabwe. So we're working across three countries. A bit of background information on the target community. We've in fact got four communities in, across the three countries. If I start first with a bit of introduction on the Zimbabwe context, we're working um, at a town called Bankbridge, which is in southern uh, Zimbabwe at the border with South Africa. Um, and it has a, a high prevalence of HIV. And then the climatic challenges are mainly related to drought. Um, but because it's a border town, there's high levels of labor migration and the resulting socioeconomic problems and high levels of food insecurity. In Malawi, we're focusing on the Chikawa district in southern Malawi across two traditional authorities. And I'm sure people have been watching the news. And as we speak now, it's suffering from devastating floods where more than uh, up to 200 people have lost their lives and more than 200,000 people have been displaced because their lands have been totally flooded. Um, so this is the, the situation that our, um, our call for innovation is in fact trying to deal with, that they suffer these, these devastating floods and then they also have droughts leading to chronic food insecurity. In South Africa we have two communities. One is the um, Khadikhali community in the northern part of the country in Limpopo province. There's villages that we're focusing on there in, in collaboration with the University of Limpopo. And there, the typical problems relate more to drought for the, for the farmers. And, and then 
south, just north of Pretoria, the city of Pretoria, we have a community called Pyramid. Um, it's a peri-urban area where there's some farming taking place, but um, all the communities in the three countries that we are focusing on actually have a high HIV um, rate, but we're not focusing directly on that, but rather on some of the underlying problems relating to food security and income generation which perpetuate the cycle of poverty. There's more information on, on all of these communities um, that we had collected through qualitative um, data collection and engagement with the communities during last year. So there's more information on the, the call documents on the website that will, um, will link you to the website later. But we, uh, we learned of the shocks and stresses in the communities on the, based on the qualitative data and then we held a workshop with uh, member institutions and the, the RAN um, team from Makarere in order to um, select and design the intervention pathway. So I would like to introduce you now to the, the Rick for Fig intervention pathway. There's three of them, the first one being improved life and entrepreneurship skills, the second one being diversify local economy for resistance, and the third one being transform agricultural practices and markets for resilience. If we look in more detail at intervention pathway one, there the, the basic problem is that people are, con are constrained by a lack of entrepreneurial skills and limited access to finance. They also um, tend to have a low educational level, so there's not much human capacity, capital to, di to diversify. In the country in, in, across the subcontinent, there's up to 30% of people who are unemployed and therefore dependent on social grants and NGO work. So the intervention pathway seeks solutions to develop models and approaches um, or technology for promoting life and entrepreneurship skills. And this we want to focus specifically in South Africa and Malawi context. We hope through this to reduce vulnerability to food insecurity and promote opportunities for income generation taking into account specific contexts in target communities in South Africa and Malawi. Perhaps some ideas um, that engineering types might be interested in is, is that we need to um, pick up on entrepreneurship and business skills as well as promoting life skills so that possibly small businesses could be developed um, and that would be appropriate in both South Africa and Malawi. The second intervention pathway is to diversify local economy for resilience. The background to this is that because of the target communities being highly dependent on rain-fed subsistence farming, so vulnerable, vulnerable to the climatic challenges. Um, and their adaptation to this is limited because of their, their limited livelihood options, as well as the limited financial um, access. So the, the solution would be to target, up to empower target communities by diversifying their livelihood using simple but highly profitable farm and non-farm businesses. So the solution should be to create opportunities for better financial inclusion, the savings and access to credit, as well as the um, diversified businesses. This would be to reduce vulnerability to food insecurity and promote opportunities for income generation in the private communities of all three countries. Some ideas that are um, highlighted in the, in the box on the right are that one would want to tap in in South Africa context to the service related market. Um, so that would be things like recycling and so on, and empowering small stock live, small livestock farmers to um, diversify their, their products. In Malawi, it might be technology that is oriented to business enterprises or early warnings um, for the flooding so that people can be more prepared. An example in Zimbabwe would be that one might want to harness the natural resource product. There's an example there of Mopani worms. These are naturally occurring worms in the trees in the Bite Bridge area which people 
harvest and then dry, and um, it serves as a source of protein. So that could be um, maximised and, and um, done in a better quantities of better equipment. The third intervention pathway is related to transforming agricultural practices and markets to improve resilience. Here the background is that because of the dependence on subsistence agriculture and the challenge of the um, climatic uh, problem, then we need agricultural methods that um, are more effective than the current methods being used so that sufficient crops can be grown and livestock can be raised in a more efficient way. Um, so the challenge is to develop low-cost, environmentally friendly approaches and technologies to increase agricultural yield for acreage. And this is applicable in, in Zimbabwe and Malawi context. And some examples um, would be to try and tackle the, the um, and develop drought-tolerant agroforestry. Um, again, the flood early warning, increased surface irrigation possibilities, um, and post-harvest processing. Um, in Zimbabwe, it might be things to do with livestock value addition, drought colour and agroforestry, or rainwater harvesting, just as examples. There's two, I don't know if you noticed, there's two challenges under the third pathway. So challenge number four is relating to agricultural markets, or catalyzing agricultural markets. Yeah, the challenge is to develop models or approaches for agricultural markets of the future that promote new types of networks and distribution methods to catalyze enterprise and narrow the gap from farm to market. Again, applicable in Zimbabwe and Malawi mostly. Um, and examples might be training of farmers to, to do their business in a different way. Um, introducing technology that might assist with the, the multiplier capacity for price leverage, or transforming platforms that could change the whole um, relationship to the, the market to be nearer to the farmer. So that's just a, a quick, quick tour of, of the four challenges, um, and all this information can be seen in more detail on, on the detailed document on our, our website. Um, but I think it's important to highlight the innovations are not limited to technology, but could be approaches, concepts, or models. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a brand new innovation or idea. It could be something that has already been developed, but is being now applied in to, to address the, the problem or um, challenge that we have, have posed. So it would be applying it in a different social and geographical context. Um, so we're particularly interested in things that one would call paradigm changes that at least disrupt the business as, as usual um, that goes on and that have high transformative potential and scalability. To give you a little bit of information relating to um, the actual structure of, of the grant, um, it's structured in three phases over the next two and a half years. Um, the first phase is called the solution development phase, and we would be awarding six innovators or groups of innovators grants, and each grant is between the value of 15,000 and 35,000 US dollars. The second phase would be the piloting or refining of the, of the, the concept. Um, we would select three of the six to go forward into this phase, and they would be awarded between 35 and 65,000 US dollars. The final phase, which would be the scaling phase, um, only two projects would be funded, and that would be um, the amounts of 75 to 125,000 um, dollars. We would also work with, with projects reaching phase two and three to try and secure additional funding from other sources um, to, to maximize the possibility of success of the innovation. Um, the who can apply? It's basically any organization from anywhere in the world. 
that the main um, prerequisite is that it's a legally reg registered organization in the country where it is based um, and that it, it is following the laws in that particular place. So that's the only restriction. Otherwise, we would encourage any organization ranging from university students to non-governmental organizations as well as community-based organizations to feel free to apply. The, the first phase of the application is only a two-page concept note that needs to be filled in, and the format can be found on our, our grant website, which is grants.ranlab.org. On that form, you would indicate which specific challenge you're applying for, and if you do choose to apply for more than one challenge, you would fill in um, a form for each individual application or, or challenge. Um, we're able to support any questions and answers, um, and we've been posting frequently the answers to frequently asked questions, and we're also running this webinar as part of the, the promotion and explanation of, of the core. Um, so those are the support activities. Um, so what happens to the concept note once we've received it? All concept notes will be assessed. We've established a um, panel of, of reviewers, and they're grouped according to the, the different challenges. So they're experts in relation to a particular challenge. All concept notes will then be reviewed, and a limited number of them will then be invited to submit a fuller application that explains the idea um, and the how it would, would address the, the challenges posed, as well as the budget and so on. So we expect to receive a few hundred of the initial concept notes, and those will be then um, filtered down, and a limited number of maybe between 30 and 40 would be asked to then submit a full application. It is from these full applications that we would then be seeking to make the award of the first six um, innovators to work in phase one. And the criteria that we would be applying in, in selecting those six is that they obviously need to align to the pathways and our theory for change. It, they need to include human capacity development and agency. They would have to contribute to the conservation of the environment as well as um, be of a nature that they, they can be scaled up to a particular business um, model. And again, um, the full applications would be reviewed by our panel of reviewers. A little bit more detail on the time frame then. So the, the six lucky innovators who get to um, be invited to participate in phase one, that would run from May to November 2015, which is a six month period. From those six, we would then down select three projects to continue into phase two, which would run from December 2015 to September 2016, a period of nine months. Thereafter, the two final projects that would go up to full scale would be supported from October 2016 to August 2017, a period of 10 months. Um, so to give you an idea of the support that the innovators who are um, part of phase one to three, we would be giving a lot of, of training. We would engage mentors that match the, the project and the need for technical advice. And there would be a linkage to the community that I have described before so that the, the ideas can be piloted, tested, and then scaled up in the final phase. So finally, just to make it clear that the, I've mentioned the website as well already, and then the email, if anybody has additional questions, you're welcome to email support.sarylab at randlab.org, or even phone us in Pretoria on the number given on the slide. Um, so I hope that's given some um, background information and some detail and that people's minds are ticking over fast with potential ideas 
you then submit on the two page um, the two page concept note which needs to be uploaded and reach us by the 30th of January. So you've got just over a week to um, put your ideas to, to, to the concept note. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to ask Dr. Wanjiko just to comment on the, the final slide that relates to collaboration opportunities. Um, thank you, Dr. Kirsty, for highlighting the risk for feed challenge. And uh, it's clear what the innovation intervention pathways are. And I hope in all that presentation, our attendees have seen opportunities for leveraging technology to address some of these challenges. So I just want to summarize this presentation by talking about collaboration opportunities between RAN and the big network of ASME and E4C. Uh, the first and most obvious, of course, is in developing interventions that can strengthen resilience to adverse climate effects. And uh, as I said, we put out open calls for uh, RFA for people to respond to, but more importantly, they're seeking partnerships because technology on its own cannot really solve any problem. It is the people who conceptualize the problem and develop it from a human-centered perspective and then create the whole value chain to deliver the value that is important. So we, you can come in as an individual with an idea through an RFA or through emailing us directly for our, our collaboration opportunities. And we have uh, four resilience labs, as I mentioned, across Africa, and we'll be willing to connect you with other engineers or academics or people from private sector in the countries that you're interested in working in, in terms of building resilience. Then very important for us, we're seeking mentors because as a university-based network, we're trying to develop um, innovative capacity because one of the strength, most important ways to build resilience is to build capacity to solve one's problems. So we are trying to develop capacity within the industry for innovation and that is a process that requires mentorship. So we'd be very happy to get mentors from the engineering discipline or from technology who would be willing to work with some of the students that are already we've already funded and given seed grants to. Some are working on diagnostics, some are working on uh, solar irrigation. There are people who are already doing very interesting stuff, but what you need is technical expertise to help mentor and steer this uh, thinking into tangible products. Then we're also looking for people who will be willing to offer capacity building, either through webinars or even physical visits to our labs and our university. And that is just uh, giving us an email. We say this is an area I'm interested in in terms of the areas you've highlighted. And we can see how you can maybe talk to our team of innovators or team of students. And we'd be very happy to have that uh, cross pollination of ideas. Um, then, as uh, Kasi mentioned, we are looking for expert reviewers. So if you feel you've got expertise in any of the areas we've highlighted in the RIC for FIG and you'd be willing to serve as an expert review of the concept notes that I received, we'd also be very happy to hear from you. And you can email uh, the South Africa team on that. Uh, the other aspect where we feel would we would need uh, expert, uh, expertise is on technology evaluation. Uh, there are many technologies out there, but whether they do what they purport to do and whether they offer value to the end user, I, there's not too much work being done in terms of technology evaluation. Um, and this is a new area for us. We would be seeking people interested in that area of research or of evidence building to also partner with us. Lastly, and also very importantly, is the partnership, either for expertise, as well as for scaling. We know the kind of speed grants we're giving may not be too much, but it's to prove a concept and come up with a uh, pilotable prototype. But from there, we need partners either across the value chain, from marketing, from business models, from access to the technologies that have been developed in terms of uh, availing them to the poorest of the poor who need these technologies. So we're looking for partners who feel they could offer something in terms of uh, ensuring that the technologies and the challenges we're addressing do have an impact on the people that we are focusing on. And those are really the farmers that are uh, affected by climate variability in Africa and also in other developing parts of the world. Uh, thank you very much for listening to us. I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wanjiko. Thank you so much, Kirsty and Deborah, for uh, the introduction to uh, the, the challenges. This has been really informative and um, I'm certainly 
quite pleased to see such tangible opportunities for us to continue working together and especially to engage a lot of the E4C membership in contributing their skills um, and their resources. So a number of questions have come in, and for those of you who are interested in, in uh, having a question answered, please do enter that question into the Q&A widget so that uh, we can keep track of those coming in. Uh, I see there's a great conversation happening in the group, so uh, please do continue with that. But I'm going to swing it over uh, to the presenters now, and uh, there's been a request for uh, the presenters to speak a little bit more broadly and provide some additional examples regarding the entrepreneurial skills and that aspect of the challenge. And if maybe you can um, speak a little bit about some, uh, you know, examples that you've seen as effective already, um, case studies that you maybe are able to share to spur the thinking of our attendees. It's Kirsty here. Shall I talk to that? Sure. Um, I think the idea with seeing entrepreneurial skills as a potential solution is that um, the dependence on um, subsistence farming has clearly um, got too many challenges in the subcontinent. And with uh, the, the country is developing quite fast in the sense of the urban industrialization and so on. It seems that there have been quite um, successful innovations that can reach far and wide, especially into the rural areas that may be using mobile technology um, you know, that enhance access to finance and banking and communication. Um, so, so there's a lot happening in those um, areas that could possibly be linked with entrepreneurial skill development and that might increase the, the diversity for the farming community without them moving from the, the farming areas. Um, and then I think the idea is also to, in relation to um, maximizing local economy, um, things like small shops and other innovations that, that could actually stimulate the local economy um, so that farmers can potentially get involved in, in other activities, with, again, without moving from where they are, but engaging in other sorts of, of business um, activities relating to services or selling other consumable goods. Fantastic. Um, so we're going to drill down into some specifics related to the challenges and then zoom out again. Uh, we have a couple of questions regarding um, the geographic specificity for uh, the challenges. Uh, this particular listener is interested to know if there are some villages targeted. And I apologize in advance for mispronouncing uh, the, the locations here, Bates Ridge, Matabelalan in Zimbabwe. Um, are, are there specific villages that are being kind of zeroed in on, or is it more of a general call countrywide? Um, the work in Zimbabwe would be very specific to the Black Bridge area, and even more specific within the sort of broader town of, of Black Bridge. There are some specific uh, villages which are being targeted. Unfortunately, I don't have that information to hand right now. But I think through email we can possibly um, respond to, to the, the person who's interested um, and, and get them that information. Fabulous. <clears throat> and uh, we encourage everyone to, to reach out to uh, RAN representatives. I, I've put up the slide now for you uh, to see uh, what the email address is uh, for those of you who are interested in directly getting in touch. Um, and also the website where there's more information available. Um, on a practical note as well, there's a question regarding whether the call uh, for submission to the grants is open worldwide or um, if it's limited to USC contributors. Well, my understanding is that it is open worldwide, although the logistics of working with somebody from um, beyond the southern African area, I'm not sure how we would solve. 
um, especially when it comes to pilot testing in one of our demonstration sites and the scalability, um, you know, scaling it up. So, you know, officially it is open worldwide, but the logistics may be a challenge. So it's, it, uh, I think you mentioned as part of uh, the, the timeline that there is a period where they'll be piloting and scaling. I, I've pushed the slide live now. Um, it's, uh, if I'm understanding at that time, it would be required for the, uh, those selected to, to be in country and available to go through both the training as well as uh, the piloting and scaling phases. Is that correct? And that would be my understanding, but I think Dr. Wan Yuko could comment as well. Dr. Wan Yuko, are you on mute? <laughs> um, we're, yes, we're looking to really get a little bit. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, the question is related to uh, the submissions coming from international submitters and whether there is an impact uh, for those who are not located in Africa uh, as they go, mm -hmm. if they are selected and go through the process of uh, the phases of the grant. Yes, um, so what we've done is that at the first stage, what we're interested in is ideas and we don't really care where they come from. But by the time we make a decision to fund you, we're going to have to create a local footprint. So because all our labs are situated within African uh, universities, so the idea is that we'd form a team around an idea. So we'd get the innovator, even if they're from India or from the US, would build a team around them that has a community footprint. So because we know that, because we're using a human-centered approach, so you first have to be in the community to understand really what the problem is before we mm -hmm. can then uh, so that we are solving that problem. So the idea can come from anywhere, but then we build a team around the idea. I hope that answers the question. Uh, I think that provides a good amount of context. So um, we're going to continue drilling down into some of these uh, specifics. Um, uh, one of our listeners wants to know if you would rec welcome public-private partnerships as an example if an NGO with a social enterprise is developing a sustainable a business model along with a private organization, would that be something that is suitable for uh, submission? Um, yes. In fact, uh, when, if you go to our website, we, we, are, we acknowledge different types or categories of applicants. So we're looking at teams of individuals or teams uh, from the university, but we're also looking for non-governmental organizations. And actually, in the past call that we had, more than 50% of our applicants were NGOs. So we very much welcome this private-public uh, partnership um, because that already brings in the kind of partners we need to ensure that we get to the community. Fantastic. And we have a question regarding uh, some of the top priority areas with respect to technology. Um, on behalf, I guess, and according to RAN, uh, are there any identified top technology priority uh, priority areas due to climate variability that need urgent intervention? So, for example, uh, are some of these areas such as housing or roads or uh, hospitals, agricultural practices like poor mechanization, access to amenities, or poor harvesting harvest handling techniques are um, are those uh, ones that you would uh, like to see kind of front and center? Um, yes, thank you for that question. Uh, when we talk about this particular theme of uh, strengthening resilience to adverse climate effects, so anything around agricultural production is a top priority. So here we are looking at water, technologies related to water from the harvesting to the storage to the purification. We are also looking at uh, things to do with post-harvest processing, so from dryers to mechanized, uh, mechanized uh, uh, whatever processes in the farm. Uh, transport, cheap transport from the from the farm to the market or wherever. So our priority would be technologies that empower farmers. And then there's a the very important aspect of alternative energy sources, because right now we find that many of the communities continue to use uh, wood fuels and charcoal, and in mm -hmm. the face of climate change, we should not be cutting down trees, we should be planting more trees. So what are these uh, low-cost, alternative energy sources, that is really, really critical. 
Um, that, that's, I don't know if my colleagues want to add, but those are the ones that really highlight. And then, of course, uh, diagnostic, medical diagnostics for common diseases like uh, waterborne diseases, for climate related mm -hmm. diseases such as malaria, et cetera, because our communities are really suffering from this. Right, so it's quite broad. So, if uh, someone's project is beyond the concept note stage, uh, at what point should they be submitting their idea to RIC for FIG? Since at this point you're seeking out those concepts. Okay, I think I can also respond to that one. So the mm -hmm. concept note stage for the RIC for fix is basically want to understand the idea you have and the justification that it builds resilience in one of our intervention pathways. But as you submit your concept, we also ask you to indicate the level of development. Is it just at an idea stage? or do you have a working prototype, or is this something that is ready to go to market? With that, it doesn't mean that if your product is ready to go to market, you have a better advantage over somebody who has an idea. We are first judging the merit of the idea in terms of the, the potential to build resilience. So at this stage, we are working with all levels of development, but the, the terminology is a concept for us because we are first vetting the ideas at that stage, and then we go to the full proposal. Uh, so don't be discouraged or think that there's another phase you have to wait for if you already have something that's already built. Of course, the challenge is for you to demonstrate that if you already have something that's built, that in fact it takes into account the concept uh, of our community, it is human-centered, that would be the where the person would have to be innovative in trying to show the fit between what we're asking for and what they had already conceptualized before our call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, related to that, it seems that someone's interested if there's target completion times uh, that you would prefer for the submissions. So I suppose in terms of timelines uh, for uh, the concepts, is there any uh, constraint whatsoever? Um, Kathy, you could answer that. Well, we went through that on one particular slide. Um, so the projects are in, you know, would run, a successful project would go over the three phases um, with different um, time frames for each phase and ultimately would complete in um, August 2017. So the first phase was May to November this year. The second phase was December to September um, 20, 2015 to 2016, which is nine months. And then the final phase um, would be October 2016 to August 2017, which is 10 months. Does that answer the question? Yes, roger that. So uh, we have time for two more questions, and we're going to be running over, so I do apologize to those of you who had to help off at the hour mark. But this is a great question, and maybe, uh, Wanjiko, I believe you're, you're going to tackle this one, is, what do you see uh, the role of uh, information technology in all of this? Okay, thank you. Uh, that's also a really good question, and uh, I'll be happy to attempt to answer it. Um, so, of course, when you look at information technology, we're basically talking about collection as well as dissemination of either data, information, or knowledge. So, at, in terms of building resilience, there are so many opportunities at the three levels. So at the top, we're talking about knowledge, and uh, also to mention that, of course, a mobile phone is the prevalent device of choice, is uh, building the capacities of the beneficiary, either through information, and that is being done a lot. Then uh, there's also access to services. So for instance, if you come up with this solar irrigation pump and you want to go to save up to buy, so we have these mobile-based saving schemes that allow poor people to save up for something using a mobile savings uh, scheme. Uh, so ICB card also very critical in terms of service delivery, but also in the area of uh, data collection, like sensor technology. If you're trying to maybe monitor the moisture content in some granary that you've constructed as a, uh, as a storage in the community, then you can use a mobile-based uh, platform to collect that data and disseminate it to some central server or something. So the, the, at the different levels of data, information, and knowledge, there's a lot of scope, and we see that from either empowering the communities or uh, helping us monitor the technologies we are deploying to the communities, monitoring the use, because we may be saying, 
we've deployed this, but we don't know whether people use this. And I think there's a pro project, I think, at UC Berkeley, where they actually monitor whether people use the cook stoves that they have designed mm -hmm. by including sensors on that, yeah? So there's a whole gamut of uh, opportunities to leverage, especially the mobile phone in Africa, setting, to and, collect information mm -hmm. that can empower the designers. And I, I want to add to that and build on that point, and thank you so much for emphasizing some of these good examples for all of you who are listening and specifically uh, seeking out per examples of a prior art. Uh, we do have a variety of articles in Engineering for Change speaking exactly to some of these ICT 4D innovations related to agriculture and beyond for you to draw inspiration uh, from those. So with that, I'm just going to leave one last question, which is a very practical question. Uh, given that this webinar was held today and the application uh, deadline is at this point uh, nine days away, uh, is RAN considering pushing the deadline forward to allow uh, those who participate in the webinar uh, additional time to submit applications? Um, so I'm going to let you tackle that one, put you in the hot seat. Um, I think I'll just say what I, okay, Kasi, maybe you can take that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we would hope not to have to extend the deadline and because otherwise it pushes the whole phase of, you know, program out um, and already the project timing is, is quite tight. Um, I think what I'd like to say to, to the person who has posted the question is that they need to remember that it's only a two-page concept note that needs to be in by the end of, of January. So hopefully, if you have the idea, it wouldn't be take too much time to complete that two-pager. And then if we include your idea after it's been reviewed, we would then ask you, for um, a detailed application um, and that you would have a longer time then to, to complete. So I can just urge you to, to try and meet the 30th of January deadline. We will be then counting up how many um, applications we have and what the quality is um, and possibly extending by two weeks, but I'd rather you, you try and meet the, the January 30th deadline knowing that if yours is selected on the concept note basis, you would get an opportunity to then fill in a, a much fuller application, which would then be reviewed to become potentially one of the six willing ones for phase one. Thank you for that. That was a very diplomatic answer. We really appreciate it. And for all of you who are listening, uh, we do have to uh, sign off as we are quite over time, but we want to thank all of you for attending for your wonderful questions and, and certainly we hope that you will submit your applications to this challenge. Uh, for those of you who are in the U.S. and are eligible to get professional development hours, please uh, follow the instructions on our page and submit the code that you see listed on the slide. And any additional questions are very welcome at our uh, webinar's email address, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Uh, please become a member to get information about upcoming webinars and we look forward to catching all of you on our future webinars in 2015. And thank you most of all to our presenters, uh, Dr. Wanjiku, uh, Dr. Christy, and uh, Deborah on behalf of Roy. We thank you so very much for taking the time out of your busy days and staying late hours after work uh, to speak with us. So have a good one, everyone, and we will catch you on our next webinar. Take care.